Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, we have just popped in on Bailey's uh, hosting day. Uh, today, this afternoon, I am going to be uh, talking with uh, Nikolai Foster. So uh, for those of you who don't know Nikolai, he is the artistic director at the Curve Leicester. A uh, huge, huge number of incredible productions under his belt, working uh, on productions like Streetcar Name, Desire, um, uh, Officer and a Gentleman, Sunset Boulevard, uh, West Side Story, White Christmas, um, I've got so many here. Uh, Diary of Anne Frank, As You Like It, uh, Calamity Jane, not necessarily in that order, I have to say. Uh, but we are very lucky to be joined by the fabulous Nikolai this afternoon. Hello, how are you doing? Hi, Rosie. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you all. Thanks so much for having me on this very rainy afternoon, or at least it is very rainy um, here in Leicester. Is it? The sun has been out today, which has kind of been nice because it has rained quite a lot but we've lost the heat wave we had last week so that was a little bit unbearable down here in the south yeah i can imagine it was pretty unbearable here in leicester i mean it was amazing to see the sunshine and you know sort of getting out and having lovely walks but certainly working from home in the you know it was pretty intense that's for yeah. sure it was a lot there was a lot of not being not wearing a huge amount sort of from the waist down you know just kind of like doing the top bit for zoom and then fans and you know shorts um <laughs> yeah it goes. and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon guys uh, if you are watching you can ask questions uh, as we go through the session um and uh, uh nicola will and i will do our best to answer them uh but yeah so thank you so much for joining us so we just want to have a sort of bit of a chat with you uh, with you about your background and your experience in theater so tell us how you got into theater you, your passion started at school, is that right? Yeah, that is right. It's quite um, a long story, to be honest. So I'll try and be quite um, succinct. Mm. I grew, we came to the UK, I think, when I was um, three or four and grew up in and around sort of Yorkshire, so quite sort of um, rural <laughs> working class uh, communities and went to a brilliant uh, bog standard comprehensive school. Um, and there was no real sort of, um, you know, focus on theatre or the arts mm -hmm. per se. Um, and there was a sort of period at, at school where I was really badly bullied. And it really was sort of, you know, sort of years of um, torture, quite frankly. And it became unbearable. And there was one um, particular evening where I was sort of being pursued by my um um, bullies and um, literally it was sort of after hours um, at school and I was literally legging it down a corridor away from them and thinking how on earth am I gonna sort of avoid um, another kicking uh, today and literally there was at the end of the corridor there was a poster um, saying auditions for Oliver Lionel, Lionel Bart Oliver in the music room and it just so happened it was all that week and so I thought, well, that's where I'll find safety because there'll be people in the um, in the music room and I'll, I'll, I'll find sanctuary in there. So literally, having never really thought about theatre, having no sort of knowledge of it or understanding of it or, you know, having given it a second thought, I ran into the music room and sort of burst in where all of these people were sort of giving it large with um papa or something. And I announced that I was here to audition and wanted to sort of um, join in um, and that was it really that's how it started so I um, got the role of Noah Claypole and every night after rehearsals I'd stay back and talk to the musical director and you know the the director I think was one of our six was about the production and that would go into wider discussions about theatre and that's really how it started it was really my salvation I guess and um, from there it, it then sort of I suppose I do believe in fate because then we went into our sort of GCSE year and it just so happened that our English teacher was an incredible woman Miss Neat who sort of started teaching us about the Royal Court Theatre from 1956 John Osborne looked back in anger onwards and that really then got me sort of hooked immersed and that and that's where it started um, really amazing and then you went on to study at central uh no it was i actually went to drama center so just down the road from central chris stafford the chief exec at curve he studied at central right. and i was at drama center so and we were in the same year 
So um, we often joke that our paths must have sort of passed at some point during, you know, our respective trainings in um, North London. But yeah, I went to Drama Centre as an actor. Right. You know, sort of at school, all you saw were actors. You know, we went on um, school trips and, you know, all of the sort of um, GCSE and A-level drama stuff was all built really around sort of acting and the process of acting. So I thought I wanted to be an actor and it was only halfway through um, my training that I really started to sort of um, open up and understand, uh, you know, directing and, you know, started writing things for um, the students in my year group, started to sort of put projects together um, and started to consider um, inadvertently directing. And that's sort of how I sort of flowed into it, if you like. Interesting. And so when you left, tell us about your journey from there. We have a lot of actors asking about transitioning into creative roles. What, what kind of what was your journey from, from Drama Centre? Well, in my third year, I had to carry on doing the acting because it was an acting uh, degree course, whatever that right. means. I mean, basically, it was Drama Centre being very clever back in the day, how they got the funding, you know, so you only had to pay a thousand pounds, which was in those days was sort of covered by the um, county council um, in my case. But yes, yeah, so we were doing this notional acting degree. I mean, how you sort of give somebody a degree in acting, I'm not sure. But anyway, it made our tuition fees a lot more um, affordable. And, and they were just amazing that they said, you know, we will, um, you know, assist the directors in your third year, learn about directing if, if this is what you're in into. So I was assisting in my third year. And as part of that, um, there was a, um, a fax came through, but, you know, back, back in the day in, in the sort of um, office and the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch were looking for a rehearsal assistant, basically a dog's body, somebody to make tea, somebody just to help out in rehearsals. And I thought, well, this is amazing, the opportunity to get into a professional rehearsal room and, you know, learn about how all of that works. Um, so every afternoon I'd toddle off on the district line up to uh, Hornchurch and I'd assist on the importance of being earnest. And then again, fate. In the green room there, there was um, a poster for the um, Regional Theatre Young Directors Scheme. You know, this yeah. wonderful idea that you could go to a regional theatre for 18 months and be paid and learn and train on the job. Um, and rather naively, I think, had I realised the sort of um, importance of that scheme, I maybe wouldn't have had the confidence to apply, but because I was sort of so naive and green, um, I sent off my application and a few months later I was on the train to Sheffield beginning my 18 months with Michael Grandage at the Crucible at the moment he was sort of really um, taking flight as a director so ended up staying there for three years not only working as an assistant director but helping cast shows helping the crew dismantle sets learning about all aspects of marketing mm -hmm design you know the whole sort of shebang and and from there then was given a show to direct at Sheffield and from there really hustled wrote letters um sent my CV off to every artistic director and producer whose work I'd followed and sort of felt passionately about so I think those would be my sort of key tips you know identify the theatres the theatre companies the producers mm -hmm that you may be interested in working for as a director, as a choreographer, whatever it might be, as a theatre designer, and then see what opportunities they may have for, you know, a young designer, a, a rookie director to come and assist, um, to come and work within their organisations. And I think that's the best way, not only to sort of um, help develop a, a career in those sort of industries, but also to really learn, you know, the great thing about assisting whatever sort of capacity it's in, you're able to observe and yes yeah. you can help out and yes you can provide invaluable um sort of resource to a production but ostensibly your job is observing and learning and challenging mm. yourself how you may do things differently or how you know if you were leading that rehearsal how you may um you know challenge yourself to make it better or you know be inspired by the director you're observing so i think that's the key in any of those training courses like rtyds yeah Kirk Beck do a very good course for um directors they're fantastic but i'd say as actors you're in such a great position because you know often nowadays 
I don't observe other directors' work. And I think back right. on those days in Sheffield and think, God, it was so amazing. You know, everybody from, you know, Josie Rourke to, you know, Rufus Norris, all of these yeah. incredible uh, directors coming through the door and you got to observe them. Whereas now, of course, you're sort of flying solo and you sometimes yearn for the day where you could really watch somebody else and learn from um, somebody else. But as actors, yeah. of course, you're always in the space. You're always working with different creatives and also um you know as actors always think of yourself as creatives you are a mm. creative artist your job I think increasingly so is to be um an imaginary sort of vessel for you know the overall vision of a production for the voice of the playwright and your our job is to realize that in a sort of three-dimensional visceral multifaceted creative way and so in that respect I think we're all creatives and I really enjoy the fact that despite all of the noise and the sometimes the really sort of um, angry voices we've heard over the last sort of few months mm. you do get a sense that theatre is moving towards a much more creative truly collaborative sort of landscape and that's something certainly at Curve that we hold really dear that everybody yeah. from the cleaner to the artistic director to the producer to the actors were all creative and we all have something invaluable and unique to offer to a creative process that's brilliant i love your comment as well about you know if i was so young i just kind of wrote off and didn't think twice about it and it's so true that as we get older i think we kind of doubt ourselves or second guess something and say oh well, i wouldn't get that or will i look silly but actually that kind of youthful um, exuberance, I suppose, allows us to kind of grab opportunity that we mustn't let ourselves slow down as we kind of get older and that let that hold us back. And exactly yeah. what you said, you know, we always say to you, you know, go out and get the experience, find out, work in a casting office, find out if it's actually the reality of it is something that you love to do and, you know, try and work with directors and agents and whatever side of it, you know, that experience will be absolutely invaluable. And um, yeah. we've got a question actually related to that from uh, Tosca57. says, I've been working as a freelance director and increasingly interested in one day running a building. How would you suggest getting relevant experience, especially if I'm past the training ops of RTYDS? Well, in terms of getting um, the relevant experience, I really do feel like the assisting is such a good route to go down because you know if it's within a building based company then you really are immersing yourself in that theatre and learning about um, how all of the different departments communicate and work together and collaborate um, together but I'd also say if you're really interested in being an artistic director then it doesn't necessarily have to be through the root of a director. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, through assisting. It's about going into those organisations and it might be working or learning with, you know, a bit about how the marketing team works or learning about the production team, learning about producing, because the more sort of knowledge, the more experience you have, um, the better. And I think especially nowadays, there is again a movement, a sense that they're not necessarily, you know, the boards and the sort of people in power aren't necessarily looking for people who have, you know, per se done it before. There is more of a sense now, if you've got the talent, if you've got the sort of sense of adventure, if you've got the ideas, if you have a sort of good overall sort of understanding of a way a, an organisation of building works, then, and you display the sort of um, brio and chutzpah and, you know, sort of dynamism that's required to sort of drive an organisation, then I do get a sense that these organisations are starting to think, OK, well, let's be outside the box a little bit. We don't need to work with somebody who's necessarily had 25 years experience. I mean, right. I remember when I was starting, it was, you know, I just thought, well, I don't stand a chance. I'm a working class person from the north. I didn't go to Oxbridge. I'm not sort of part of that traditional establishment and it has been really um, incredible I think the last few years I mean obviously there's a hell of a long way to go but it does feel like so many of those walls are starting to be eroded and if they're not being eroded from the inside it's you know incredible talent from the outside that's literally smashing through um, the walls now and I think that's really um, exciting 
Sorry, I waffled on a bit there. I hope that has answered no, no. your question a little bit. It's a great answer. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about this strange period of hiatus that theatre's in at the moment, and that actually is this potentially now an opportunity to change things that have potentially gone before that we haven't been happy with as an industry or kind of to realise new ideas and to, you know, to really affect new change and embrace new ideas. And I think, do you think that you can see a shift happening in traditional theatre in that sense? That's a great question. It's a tricky one, I think, for me to answer because to, 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 for two reasons. One is the last few months have genuinely been immersed and continue to be immersed in firefighting and yeah. genuinely fighting for the survival of our theatre. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, you know, the wider theatre ecology. So they're really, whilst I'm aware there's a lot of great um, initiatives and mm -hmm. um, there's been some incredible work being done around mm -hmm. all aspects of diversity for example yeah it's not something I've, I've i felt incredibly sort of connected or immersed in just simply because the day-to-day -day has been literally fighting fires yeah um secondly and i say this whilst completely acknowledging there's a hell of a lot of work to do we've always at curve prided ourselves on being a welcoming egalitarian organization where if if we do identify barriers or walls or blockages we immediately try to dismantle them and, and break them down yeah um, and so i i feel very passionately that we've done a lot of good work before all of this lockdown sort of came yeah. into to being and we'll continue with that same spirit of being scrappy and playful and curious. And because our organization is run by two, I suppose, working class gay men, we have experienced a lot of um, prejudices and a lot of the snobbery, which I think is inherent in British theater. Right. So certainly in Curve, our antenna is really tuned um, very, um, closely to the frequency around discrimination and around yeah. what it means to be excluded. And I, I feel very proud that when we do identify things that are wrong or that we should be doing better, we, we go in quite fast and hopefully sort them out. And of course, that I hope that doesn't come across as arrogant because as I say, there's a lot more work to be done. Mm. But, um, but yes, in answer to your question, I do... I do feel there is change coming, but I also feel very strongly that there shouldn't need to be all of this debate. There shouldn't need to be all of this discussion. Right. Diversity, communicating with your communities, putting your communities at the center of your work and telling their stories shouldn't be a new idea. It shouldn't be a challenging idea. Um, and, I really do believe we should just be getting on and doing it. Yes. And there's been so much chatter and so much noise and so much um, debate. And I think as theatre people, we're very guilty of that. We enjoy talking. We, as you can see now, I'm wittering on until I'm blue in the face. And I feel we need to stop talking now. We need to stop coming up with strategies around diversity and um, socioeconomic um, opportunities for people from disadvantaged backgrounds and we just need to get those doors open get mm -hmm. get the boundaries down in our organizations because there is no negative impact by having a more diverse organization mm -hmm. we having it all it leads to is more interesting more dynamic more eclectic more um, incredible stories being told being celebrated being shared by made by more incredible people so Again, I don't want to be glib in any way, but I think there is change coming and there's been change for a long time, but really mm. we shouldn't be chatting about it so much because it really should be easier and um, all it leads to is, is positives. Great, great answer. Tell us about how you came to um, the Curve. How did that happen? Well, that sort of um, leads on a little bit from thinking about sort of um, 
I guess a lot of the snobbery and the barriers that exist within sort of British theatre. So mm -hmm. before Curve, after my experience at Sheffield, after Sheffield, I must have worked for about 15 years as a freelance theatre director. And I always sort of yearned and longed to get back to a building. And I was sort of so um, passionate about being an artistic director and working within a team, within an organisation, having had that incredible time at Sheffield. Um, and so when these jobs came up, I started to go for them and was always unsuccessful, um, didn't have enough experience, wasn't a right fit, wasn't good enough. You know, it was always, um, you know, the sort of same thing. And, you know, for, I'm sure there's many people listening in or watching, you know, whether you're going for an audition or a job interview, especially within our business, you know, these can be, this can be like two weeks to do an application for, you know, some of these jobs or for an audition, you might be going back like five times. I mean, you've more or less learned the entire show, you know, by the time you get to your final audition. And, and I thought, well, actually, maybe it's not for me being an artistic director because I've been for enough jobs and I keep failing and um, I'm not successful and, you know, let's play to my strengths and for whatever reason, it's not going to happen. And then Curve came along and I saw the advert and I thought, well, it looks great, but look, it's a massive organisation. I've been for so many other theatres, some much smaller. There's no way they're going to um, consider me. So I thought, well, I won't apply for this one. Um, and it was incredible that they, um, they, you know, somebody called up and said, you know, have you thought about applying for Curve? Because we'd be really interested to hear from you. And I thought, well, that's... That, that's never happened before and that immediately feels different because in all the other jobs it sort of felt like you know you weren't necessarily wanted even though you know you'd spent a load of time on this application it felt like there was this sort of unspoken barrier if you like mm -hmm. and here was a theatre saying oh we'd really welcome hearing from you and hearing your ideas so that in itself was refreshing yeah um and then yeah went through the interview process and it was just, there was an incredible um, chair, um, Sir Philip Tasker, and an incredible chief executive, Fiona Allen, and they were prepared to, I suppose, what many venues would consider to be a risk. They took a risk on somebody who'd never been an artistic director, had no experience of working in an organisation of this scale or complexity. They saw something and they you know, they went for it. And I'm forever grateful to them for investing in talent and taking a risk and, um, you know, opening the door for me, I guess. And you've been there five years now. Yeah, this is my sixth year. Amazing. And it's just been a roller coaster. I mean, I'm so proud of what myself, Chris, the team, everybody's achieving it really. I mean, before COVID, I mean, because there has been a bit of time to reflect over the last few months. And mm -hmm. this morning I actually went into the building and had to look at um, some space. We we're thinking about, you know, what can we do within a sort of socially distanced world? Yeah. So we were physically in the space having a look. And I mean, it was obviously very sad this morning because it's just a sort of empty, quiet, silent, dusty space now. But, you know, when we closed in March, you know, we'd just done West Side Story, the most successful yeah. uh, musical we'd ever produce we'd just done giraffes can't dance which julia thomas who was a young director who we brought on the rtyds had um delivered for us amazing composer tash taylor johnson who had um come through the Cameron mcintosh young composer scheme we just opened cameron's production of phantom of the opera we had five shows either on tour about to go into the rehearsal the youth theater was firing on all cylinders about to um, present um, a repertory season of work, the community company, our affiliate groups. I mean, the building, you'd go in at 8.30 in the morning, it was just noisy and loud and messy, and you'd leave at 11 o'clock at night, and it was equally sort yeah. of anarchic and filled with creativity and activity. So, um, yeah, it's an incredible place, and we're all just desperate to get back to that. Yeah, I think everyone is. Um, uh, you have a reputation both at Curve, but also you personally for hosting, hosting, I suppose, holding really um, open and friendly and um, inviting audition spaces. Um, the actors feel very, very comfortable going to see you send cards after each audition. There's a very, there's a great sense of respect from the team to the actor. Where does that, where does that come from? It was that 
obviously that's a culture that you brought uh, with you, but you know that's not that's not traditionally um, you know normal within theatre. Unfortunately, a lot of actors, and I was an actor for a while before I went into casting, and it's not always a very positive um, space. It can feel judgmental sometimes, or that you're not being listened to. By so, where did that come from? Um, yeah, it always surprises me, and I think it saddens me a bit to hear that you know not all casting um, uh, scenarios mm -hmm. are, are positive. I think it must have started really. My first sort of jobs as a director were working with the casting director, Kay Magson. Yeah. And she always, I, I, I remember, I'm just sort of thinking out loud, it's such a, a great question, thinking where does that sort of, where does that ethic and that ethos come from? Yeah. And I suppose it must have been sort of learning from Kay because when you're a rookie director and you're starting out, you're nervous. Yes. And you're, well, you're basically terrified, aren't you, as we all are. <laughs> and so I was able to really see how Kay managed the auditions. And obviously when you you are starting out, you really are, you know, you're, you're, you're beholden on those people you're working with until you really, mm -hmm. you know, grow in confidence to really sort of take the room and take the reins. So I suppose it must have been seeds sown with Kay, really, who is so... Mm -hmm. At pains to make the actor feel at ease and relaxed and give the information and be a good communicator and I think yeah. auditions I remember way back when you know they're such a weird unusual unnatural sort of meeting aren't they I mean a job interview you know they're traditionally like half an hour you get a bit of chat right. they ask you some questions there's a bit of a debrief have you got any questions an audition for some actors, it's like come in, sing a song, go, That's or it. come in, read a bit of a scene and go. And it's it's all just so uncomfortable. Yes. And also when we were talking earlier about the idea of everybody being a creative, mm. for me increasingly, I'd rather work with people who are imaginative, who are alive, who are yeah. intelligent, who have something to say about the world as a human being. And I'd much rather work with somebody who may be didn't read the scene as well as another actor or maybe couldn't sing the high notes in as dazzling a way as somebody else but right. who has something about them who has something unique original and the only way you can find that out is if you spend time with somebody right. if you talk to them if you make them feel relaxed if you get the best out of them when they you know tell me a bit about yourself what have you been up to lately dead easy questions it only takes a couple of minutes but it leads you to some incredible places. And also, like, as a director, as theatre people, we're all interested in people, aren't we? And right. it's like, just from a voyeuristic point of view, I mean, you get to hear some incredible stories, like yeah. things you would like, like, oh, my God, you do that for your muggle job? Or, you know, it's just yeah. so, I think it's just, you know, it's a selfish thing. You want to get the best out of people. So how do you get the best out of people? You put them at their, your, their ease. You want them right. to feel creative. You want them to feel safe in the space. You want them to be the best version of themselves. They can be in that very unnatural um, scenario. So that that's where it comes from. And I think, you know, we've got a dignity at work policy at Curve. You know, we, we want all of the people who work with us to feel safe and empowered and um that starts in the audition room that starts in the job interview so you know and again we can't talk about diversity and theater being an egalitarian space and breaking down these boundaries if the first space that people are coming into is a sort of frosty people yeah. sitting behind desks it all being about weird power games yeah um it's all old-fashioned tribe quite frankly so I think that's where it that's where it comes from a desire to get the best out of people and and also to have a really meet you know to kick off on a meaningful way and even if it doesn't go the way um you know for the actor in that job in that in that yeah. audition yeah meeting them talking to them we're going to work together someday so it's all an investment in the future of course I love um when you ask you know one ask an actor so what have you been up to People think it's like a trick question, you know, like, what have you been, have you been working? It's, you know, it's that moment, isn't it? Kind of going, look, I just want this person to relax and take a breath or a genuine interest in 
okay, there's a gap on the CV or I can see you've been abroad and what was that contract like and just getting a sense of someone's personality. But certainly you can kind of sometimes see people panic and think, what's the agenda? And there's no agenda. We just yeah. want to give you some agency in the room, you know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, We're interested in you. It's your space. Yeah. Take the space. Own the space. You might yeah. only be in there for five minutes. So right. make impact. And, you know, all we can all remember is that, you know, our unique personality, our unique original flair, that is what any good director or creative is interested in. So celebrate who you are when you come into those spaces. Absolutely. Um, James says, really love your work, especially the re recent West Side Story. What are some things which really stand out in the audition room? Um, well, what I've started to do more and more of in the audition room is, especially working on musicals, rather than get somebody to read um, scenes from the play, is to get them to sort of create a monologue, to sort of write um, a sort of speech that their character can deliver. So, for example, when we were doing West Side Story, it was really um, wonderful to get the actors thinking creatively um, mm. outside the world of the play and to really think about their past, their relationship with their parents or school, maybe what their sort of hopes and sort of um, thoughts about their future might be. And... I think, again, it goes to, back to the idea of the actor being a creative um, collaborator rather than just somebody who's, you know, can kick their legs up and, and sing the right notes. You want people who are going to come with imagination and flair and ideas. Mm. Um, and so I think those auditions where people have really come in and committed to the task of writing a monologue and they've read the play and they've researched a bit around you know, when the play was set, maybe some of the, you know, certainly 1950s New York, what were the sort of, what was the political landscape like? What was society like then? And then they've delivered a monologue, which they've really thought about and invested in and made it their own. And it's those moments that really stand out in the audition room. And um, I remember when we did Greece a few years ago and there was an actor, Dex Lee, who came in and had created this incredible monologue for Danny Zuko and you just thought well there is Danny Zuko I mean if ever you believed somebody was a leader of this um you know Chicago group of lads who roamed the streets there he was he was so sort of alive and sort of captivating in the space and then um ditto standout auditions recently we um, when we worked on West Side Story Adriana who um, was just graduating from um, the Royal Academy of Music, came in to read for Maria, and she was absolutely, you know, incredible. It was like sort of um, this sort of wonderful cross between a bird and um, um, Audrey Hepburn came into the space. It was absolutely phenomenal. And, and I think those were two examples where the actors came in and they just owned the space and mm. there was just a sense of it being they were excited by the material and you know we're just going to give everything to it and so they absolutely sort of captivated the room and that's what it's about that's what you know really makes an audition I guess stand out. Great answer thank you I think I hope I've said her name right Sunea uh, says hi both being an actor from Esther Curve has done a lot for the ethnic minority was lucky enough to act in Bollywood Jane amazing experience hope yeah, I said it was a phenomenal production and that's one of the sort of highlights of the year at Curve is our community I mean we yeah. call it a community production I mean it's a professional production it just means that anybody um, from the community can be in it and Bollywood Jane was especially meaningful because it's set in Leicester on yeah. Belgrave Road, which is the Golden Mile, which is this incredible um, street where you've just got the most amazing uh, restaurants and South um, Asian Indian shops selling, you know, gold jewellery and saris and materials. And, you know, when you walk up um, the Belgrave Road, it's just the sort of most incredible experience. You just sort of feel your entire being sort of... Um, brought to life with the smells and the, the 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 sights you see and Amanda Whittington wrote this incredible play which is sort of a cross between a kitchen sink drama dealing with um, a single parent family and the complexities of a woman who's in an abusive relationship and trying to protect her daughter and then 
sort of clashed it and mashed it together with the joy, the exuberance and the escapism of um, Bollywood Jane and the company were just incredible. These amazing sort of dance um, numbers sort of counteracting with the, um, the the kitchen sink scenes. It was it was really stunning. So congratulations and nice to see you. Amazing. Interesting, um, you're talking about a play, and I think you've talked about this before, about an, an element of pigeonholing sometimes in the industry, is if you have worked um, for a period of time in musicals, that it can be very difficult to be accepted, not just as an actor, but as a creative working in uh, straight theatre as well. Um, what, do you have any advice for people who are really struggling to bridge that gap? Blimey, it's tricky because really what you need is a sledgehammer and you sort of need to bash over the heads of the, um, the people who have these narrow-minded and um, again frankly outdated and sort of very mysterious um, sort of prejudices. I mean you know if somebody has the ability to express themselves through dance or vocally through music well why shouldn't they be able to express themselves through words? I mean it's absolute nonsense as far as I can tell and you look at Shakespeare's plays, I mean, most of them are sort of musical, you know, whether it's in the language, yeah. they often have dance elements in them. I mean, he sort of wrote the original musical, I, as far as I can tell. So for me, those things are very closely aligned and there's no snobbery around doing Shakespeare. So why around musical theatre? So I think you just have to keep going at it and you just, you know, if somebody says, well, I'm not sure about, you know, casting you in this play because you've done musicals you need to say why what where does that prejudice where does that misconception come from you know if I can you know work in the most complex of art forms which is the musical mm. um why can I not do a play I mean it's just ludicrous as far as I can tell so my answer is not very helpful because again what we're dealing with is prejudice and people's narrow-mindedness and as we can see around so many things within our society and our culture, it takes decades and in some cases hundreds of years to start to unpick, um, you know, prejudice and, and people's narrow minds. So you just have to keep going and have belief in yourself. I mean, we always are casting people in musicals, in plays, who've done plays in musicals yeah. and vice versa. We just don't see it as any kind of barrier. It's just that, again, it's another great thing if you can sing and you're doing a play well wonderful because we might want to put a song in or you know it's just it's just um yeah i don't really have any constructive answer i'm sorry be better industry be better james industry always be better. Uh, yeah, my partner James always uh, tells a story about when he was going to apply to drama school and he did it a, a little bit more mature. He was kind of in his early mid 20s, not a teen. And he had a choice between applying to a musical theatre one year uh, postgrad course or going to do uh, acting. And his logic was, well, if I go into the musical theatre, I'll be trained across all three just disciplines and I'll be far more employable. And then, of course, came out the end of this one year and people kind of turned their nose up at a you know musical theatre diploma. And then he had he worked very hard to then go and he did Shakespeare and he did TV and film but he had, felt like he always had to be pushing back against some kind of preconception about his ability because he trained in three disciplines and not in one it's a it's, a, it's an interesting um it's a really interesting observation I think um Lauren this might be a difficult one to answer Lauren without having you sort of present but um she says any advice for a young actor i was scouted a few years ago and i'm currently training when in the audition room i feel like i'm coming across wrong any advice well that's a really good question lauren and i think it sort of um goes back to the ideas we were sort of maybe touching on a little bit earlier about celebrating your uniqueness and your individual flair and spirit in those audition spaces because as we acknowledged earlier they're such sort of pressured unnatural sort of environments and I think especially when we're sort of starting out and we're you know when when we're younger we feel a bit perhaps more less sure of ourselves um, because that's what growing and getting older helps us with sort of feeling a bit more confident and having a bit more of a sort of um, sense of ourselves in the world. So I think it's just working on that sort of cognitive discipline and, you know, 
and and working you know believing in yourself and those demons and those sort of things which are saying something feels wrong or i feel a bit uncomfortable it's like okay well i feel a bit uncomfortable today or i feel a bit icky in the space well that's all right accept that feeling you know before you start reading the scene or if you're asked a question and you're feeling uncomfortable or a little bit sort of uncomfortable or out of sorts have the confidence to just take a breath and then respond or start the scene or you might get halfway through the scene and actually think this isn't working again i'm really sorry just give me two seconds i'm just going to stop we're going to start again give me a moment and on we go and i think if you can sort of take control of that space and 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 have the confidence to you know take a breath when it feels a bit icky or a bit uncomfortable i think that that's really the best advice i could i could give i think that's really really great advice thank you um so just talking a little bit about um before everything happened uh things that you saw in the theater and loved what are your favorite productions that you saw pre-covid blimey that's a hard question um it's a struggle to think back that far at this point i know it's like <laughs> did, did so did long. Exist? Um, yeah i saw a monster calls at the old vic i think that must have been the middle of last year um yes. which i think had come up from bristol old vic and that was absolutely yeah. awe-inspiring the sort of um the i think it was sally cookson who directed and sort of yeah. adapted it from um the the patrick ness novel and it was just so imaginative and you know that great sort of theater sort of storytelling where you know a ladder can become you know a, a stairway to the sky or can become a door in a wall you know nothing is literal everything you know is 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 whatever your imagination wants it to be and it was just so profoundly moving as well um i thought that was really extraordinary and also small island at the national yeah. theater i really loved the you know who doesn't love seeing a great epic story told on the olivier stage and you know it was sort of in that very old-fashioned um national sort of tradition of you know a cast of thousands and you know incredible storytelling use of the space and again a really incredible story about the windrush generation it was profoundly yeah. moving and relevant and entertaining and inspiring and just seeing a load of practitioners and actors um, at the top of their game really so i think those two examples would be the ones that sort of spring to mind you've talked a little bit about um obviously the challenges that creatives and buildings are facing at this time um obviously this platform is predominantly being watched by actors at this moment do you have any advice on staying positive during this time? I think this can maybe feel a little endless um, for new grads, but also for people who've been in the industry a little while, maybe a couple of years out of drama school. So are no longer in that graduate pool that people are, you know, they think people are excited about. Do you have any advice for people at this time? Well, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it is an incredibly challenging time and you know like so many of you like all of us here today i mean there's been moments over the last few months where you're sort of just riddled with despair mm. and depression and a real sense of like how on earth do we come out of the other end of this and i think it, the only sort of thing i can offer which is i suppose the thing that's worked for me a little bit is that we have no choice you know, the, the choice of a world without theatre, without television, without actors, without designers, without our theatres is un unthinkable. And I don't mean unthinkable because it's such a big idea that we can't grapple with it, but right. that it, 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 it's just impossible and we will get through it. There is no choice. There is no alternative. Right. We will get through it. And I think as naive and as sort of um, maybe insipid as that sounds, that is what I cling to in those dark moments is that we will get on the other side of this. We will rebuild our industry, our infrastructure. There are gonna be some really dark days ahead and there will continue to be some huge challenges which we all need to come together 
and keep yeah. working hard as a collective to overcome, but we will do it. And that is really all one can say because what's the alternative? There is no alternative. We just give up um, and th there is nothing to be gained from that. So I think, yeah, we just carry on and, and positivity, optimism, it, it's a wonderful drug. It, it really doesn't have any negative um, side effects. And if you're positive and you pass on love and enthusiasm and a sense of optimism to other, other people, they'll take a bit of that and hopefully pass it on to somebody else. And it really is, you know, um, we did the production of Annie a few years ago, which was weirdly is probably one of the shows that's most ripe for revival now because it's set in the middle of a great depression and a child and children who sort of represent the future offer a sense of optimism and, uh, and hope. And um, the president at the time, um, Roosevelt, said, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And I think there really is a sense of that at the moment that, you know, the, the media have done a brilliant job in scaring us, you know, absolutely witless. Um, and I think we do have to remember that we will get through this and we mustn't be afraid of each other and coming back together and of course we have to be safe and sensible but what is life without people meeting being close together sharing stories in the theatre for me it truly is unthinkable so um yeah optimism positivity accept like i was saying to lauren you know accept there are bad days accept there are dark moments don't try and fight or grapple or argue with those feelings let them come but know they will pass and a couple of days later you'll have that optimism we'll have that sense of hope again love that and if people are feeling like they may want to have some kind of creative outlet but don't know how to go about that do you have any kind of thoughts on on how they people could start you know during this period people might want to start writing or producing or directing their own work well i think uh without sort of promoting self-promotion of the theater i think have a look on our curve website there's so yeah. much um content that we've got going on online there's quite a few initiatives that people can get involved in you can learn about our new work festival where we encourage and support and work with artists across the East Midlands predominantly and um, so there's things like that but you know reading a book is creative reading a play is creative watching a show online is creative going for a walk is creative and again yeah. I don't want to be glib or sound sort of flippant but there are so many easy quick wins we can all enjoy that genuinely will sort of help and I think because we've done we've done quite a few zooms and chats with graduates and trying to help people who are mm. sort of in this horrible situation of graduating but graduating into a sort of void of stasis basically and I think trying to keep yourself match fit reading plays as an actor is not only a creative thing but it's also keeping your sort of um cognitive function when you next have to come to an audition when you next have to think about creating a character yeah. there, um, there's a company called magnetic studios that we're working with and they're doing an amazing job of running a series of online courses whether it's voice work movement work dance classes singing classes um play reading where you just sort of log on and i think there is a there is a small fee but they're working with incredible um directors practitioners who are leading these sort of creative workshops and again um it, it just keeps the sort of juices flowing and, and keeps you match fit you know for when the auditions do start going again and i've just noticed anecdotally online you know there are a few things casting again and things are starting yeah. to get going again which i mean fills me with joy you know it's so exciting to think of somebody going into an audition room that's amazing and we've got 
things starting to happen as well it's just very slow of course uh, there is of course this platform as well which is completely free to access for workshops and master classes and vocal sessions and exactly as you've said the whole purpose of you know all of these platforms is to keep us all on our toes and keep those muscles going and the creativity flowing and keep that connection with the industry because it's so important uh nina has asked do you tend to use one specific casting director for your work and put your breakdowns on spotlight and would you be happy to receive emails from actors so they can introduce introduce themselves to you? Great question, uh, Nina. We, uh, Kay Maxson is an associate sort of artist with us at Curve, so we work with Kay a lot, but we also enjoy working with people like David Grindrod, um, Ginny Schiller, um, Jill Green, we were just working with recently before everything locked down. So um, again, sort of diversity and having an eclectic pool of people you work with, I think is really fantastic. Um, we do put everything out on Spotlight. We also put it on our website when we have casting breakdown. So we try and make it as sort of transparent as and as make the information as clear and as accessible as possible. And I love hearing from actors and, you know, if you're emailing in, just keep the email nice and short. Um, you know, we get so many emails a day. It's wonderful just to sort of snappy introduction, why you want to work at Curve, any projects you might be interested in, then including your um, CV is a great thing. So, yeah, we personally love um, to hear from you and receive emails and, and CVs. And we have a, a database, both of actors who are based in the East Midlands and also a more sort of national database of people who are interested in working with us. Brilliant. And Nayara says, approaching producing, directing as a community building is a very healthy model that keeps art from being elitist. What are some of the biggest challenges for programming for a regional theatre? Hmm. Again, it's a great question. The challenges, I suppose, come when you're Maybe there's a piece of work that's a bit more challenging. We do a lot of work at Contemporary Dance, which can sometimes be a little bit harder to sell or get an audience sort of um, feeling it would be accessible or, you know, there are sort of um, invisible barriers which perhaps buildings don't see around some work that audiences sort of sense or um, pick up on. They might think it's gonna be, you know, too highbrow or intellectual or it's not gonna be for them. So sometimes there's challenges around pieces of work which we feel um, really passionately about and we think, you know, will really challenge an audience and really, you know, inspire them. But there can be challenges around getting people in the door. Um, and then I think there are challenges around programming what is called diverse work. And by that, I don't mean work which features predominantly a South Asian or, or black company. I mean, diverse in its truest sense and at Curve, if we do a play like Memoirs of an Asian Football Casual, which is about a Pakistani lad growing up in Leicester, we don't just want the audience to be made up of young Pakistani boys. We want our upper middle class, white, very traditional posh theatre goers from the county to come and watch that play. We want young Muslim girls to come and feel welcome and feel that that play has something to say to them. We want white working class football lads from Leicester to come and watch that play. And so I think some of the challenges are when we're talking about diversity, we might present a piece of work as, you know, specifically the color purple was about the African-American experience, but we shouldn't be limiting that work to um, the Afro-Caribbean community. That is a play which yes, predominantly is about the black experience, but it's a play that we can all learn from, can all be challenged by, can all be inspired by, and is a play that speaks to all of us who are human and um, it speaks about the human condition. So I think one of the challenges is really making sure that audiences recognize that the, the work is it, it, good work, good programming, should have something to say to all of us. Um, and I think sometimes things can get put in boxes and it's really important that we keep it sort of messy and scrappy and we all feel that there's something for all of us all of the time and that we're all welcome. 
Good. Thank you so much. We're going to kind of wrap up in a second. Um, uh, Anishia says this is a lovely uh, talk to listen to. Um, uh, Indira says Belgrave Road, did you say? <laughs> um, and uh, Nina says thank you Lauren says thank you so much very appreciated uh, Nikolai thank you so so much for your time this afternoon oh, um, thank you for having me I really appreciate it just whiz by so thank you for all of your incredible insights and giving your time uh this afternoon uh for us i know that that would have been really really helpful for people um i'm going to take you out of the live stream now but don't go anywhere i just want to say goodbye before uh we go but i i know the minute i sign off there's going to be lots and lots of thank yous here we go nayara Sanea as well so thank you so much Nikolai. thank you thank you everyone great to chat to you all see you later bye bye uh, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in and all of your lovely questions. Coming up in just 15 minutes at 4.45, we have a yoga class with the lovely Jessica Parkinson. She is back with us tomorrow, just talking very quickly. We have lots of great sessions. We have the Business of VoiceOver with Christopher Tester starting in the morning. Simon Adkins is back with Advanced Pro Tap. He is, of course, uh, the Associate Choreographer for 42nd Street in the West End. Gus Gowland is here um, with a seminar on how to write a musical uh, at 1.30 tomorrow also don't miss out on uh, Gus's um, work that he's doing with the barn with the barn fest at the moment so have a little look at his twitter online Dan Tunnell is here with vocal massage and physio for singers at 3 30 and the lovely Anthony Williams who is the executive director of UK productions is here with a Q&A about agenting and also the business of pantomime guys come back at 4 45 for a session with Jessica also just to remind you we are uh, doing a call out at the moment for practitioners who might be impacted uh, at the moment financially. We have an incredible faculty that we are always looking to expand. So if you're an actor, uh, sorry, if you're a director, choreographer, uh, if you uh, are a workshop facilitator, um, a wellness coach, and you have been impacted at the moment financially by the coronavirus crisis, uh, and maybe uh, falling through the gaps with government support, let us know. We do pay practitioners to come on the platform. So email us at connect at collectivecreativeinitiative.co.uk with your ideas, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Bye-bye.